Break with Reality, part nine. It wasn't exactly behind the bike sheds, but it was behind the garages at the council estate where she lived. He was 17 and she 15 the first time. Her birthday was still a month away, but she couldn't wait any longer. He needed a bit of persuading, was scared of being labelled a pedo, but she gradually brought him round to it. She'd been eager for the past six months to be going out together, but he refused every opportunity they'd had, coming up with some lame excuse or other but each time. At last, thought Lorraine, she was finally going to feel what it was like to really do it. So, overruling the last of his Egyptians, they met, arriving separately, behind the garages. It was fumbling, it was awkward, it was messy. It was in no way the romantic dream other girls talked about when envisioning their first time, but she loved it. Every second, the suspense had been worth it. The apprehension of being caught there, the bated breath, the smell of both their perspiration, the expression on his face at the final part, the feeling of control she'd had finally. She felt like a proper woman now, and all she could think about was when they were going to do it next. Laurie had always known she was attractive to boys, to men. The furtive glances, the pretend accidental hand slips, the out and out leering whistles and suggestive winks, the suggestions themselves, offers that she'd found disgusting, yet strangely exciting in equal measure. But she was a good girl, so mum and dad had said, and the good girls didn't do things like that. That was for sluts and slappers, and no one had a good word to say about them, did they? She remembered the first time she'd seen a working girl. They'd been coming home late from an evening at the cinema and had to go through the harbour on their way home. There she was, stood at a corner, one leg propped up on the wall behind her smoking a fag. Red lipstick, black eyeliner, short skirt, black stockings and high heels. Short fake leopard skin jacket, low cut top underneath. She'd stare across at the car, cheeky smile turning to a frown after scrutinising the passengers. Her eyes locked with Laurie's for a second before averting her gaze. Laurie kept staring. What's that lady waiting there for? As the ten year old Laurie had said, fascinated yet puzzled at the street side enigma. She's miles away from the bus stop. That's no lady said her mother, nothing more. The image of that woman had stayed with Laurie ever since, tattooing itself indelibly onto her preteen brain, a permanent memory that grew in mysterious intrigue on each recollection. In Laurie's mind, the prostitute became an angel of darkness, a strange, alluring beauty that surpassed by far the saccharine pastel pink and blue, long blonde maned princesses in picture books she's been exposed to in her short lifetime. Far from being surrounded by unicorns and rainbows and fairy tales she was being fed, this princess was alone on dark, glistening streets in the depths of winter, cold, seductive red lips leaving stains in the filter of regal cigarettes. She exuded a dark, savage divinity that touched something in the very depths of Laurie's soul. The relationship with that first boyfriend hadn't lasted long after she'd given him her virginity. He couldn't keep up with her, for starters. Laurie decided she'd like to play the field for a while. After all, variety is the spice of life, right? The discretion she exercised meant she avoided, for the most part, the reputation most other girls would have garnered for carnal activities that Laurie embarked upon in those formative years of her sexual development. Boys and men sworn to secrecy over acts provided. Keep quiet and there'll be more where that came from. Then that day occurred. It wasn't long after her 17th birthday. She was with one of the older boys, probably around five or six years her senior, the friend of a friend of a friend. They met in the woods on a twilight summer's night. He'd seemed anxious, immature, inexperienced and couldn't get it up properly, so she'd had to finish him off by hand. Afterwards, when he'd pulled his trousers up and she was sorting herself out, he'd tossed a £20 note at her. Thanks, he said with a sheepish smile before disappearing back onto the path. That was an awakening. The realisation struck out that boys and men were prepared to pay for these fevered exchanges, even though it was as much her idea as it was theirs. Would it be possible to do this thing she loved in order to make m money to 
survive on. Laurie decided to experiment. From the memory she held, she dressed herself as close as possible to her angel of darkness, then crept out of the house and headed down to the harbour. She stood at the very spot where she'd seen that woman all those years ago, even assumed the body posture assimilating her secret idol. It didn't take long. Errant husbands, horny single and divorcee men were all too eager for a portion of fresh meat, especially one as young and good looking as she was. The first car crept up, slowing to a stop at the cab in front of her. She walked over, hands shaking in anticipation, and leaned in the window. The deal was struck and she got in. The guy knew her place. Laurie had walked home with 300 quid that night. A good deal richer and a good deal more experienced in what she now decided was to become her trade. Before long, she'd moved out of her mum and dad's council house and got herself a wee flat. She worked alone. Sure, there had been some rough clients, some lifted a hand to her, but she could look after herself. Laurie learned quickly and found she had a second sense about the bad guys. One of the girls who walked what worked close to her patch needed someone for a threesome with a rich oil executive and Laurie had agreed. He'd paid them 200 each for their troubles and taken her working phone number to give to one of his colleagues. Soon she'd stepped up a league and was entertaining businessmen visiting from abroad, awash with cash from the States, the Middle East and Asia, inviting her to see the insides of all the best Aberdeen hostelries and hotels. She was in control. It was done on hard terms. She wasn't beholden to any pimp and apart from the fags, had no drug or major alcohol dependency, unlike most of the other girls she'd become acquainted with while working the streets. The businesswoman with a plan. Lori was under no illusions as to how long it would last either. Younger girls were constantly appearing in the busier train spots, a sadly increasing number arriving to feed smart crack and coke habits. Eschewing the lavish lifestyle she could well afford, Laurie instead put away as much money as possible, living frugally in the knowledge it would pay dividends in years to come. Now in her thirties, with the rich oil men she entertained becoming fewer each year, Laurie had retirement from the game on her immediate horizon. She'd recently started an open university degree in economics and politics, and it was going well. She could please herself when the uni work was done and could still go out at night to make ends meet. There was still a buck to be made from the supply vessel crew members that frequented harbour bars. That was where she found herself that chilly November morning. She put in a shift that night and was just about to head for home as it was half four in the morning when these two Norwegian seamen had turned up. She had been at her favourite spot just along from the Yardarm pub, the very place she'd seen her angel all those years ago. They'd been flush with cash after coming in, from, coming in from sea earlier that day and were looking for a good time. Talk about leaving it to the last minute, eh? She'd said. I was just a way to call it a night. Yeah, we've been busy said one of the blokes, flashing a grin at his mate. Cheap hotel it was then. She took both of them on at once and had a couple of hours of fun. They'd invited her out for a drink afterwards at the early opening bar along the quayside. Why the fuck not, she'd thought. So to the coaster they'd went. She couldn't breathe through her, no her mouth. Her nose was blocked with snot, so it took a titanic effort to get air that way. Michael and Robert were doing it again. Mum will go spare when she finds out. They put something across her mouth to stop her screaming. Her hands were tied behind her back with what felt like a plastic bag, and her feet were bound with a rope or something. They were carrying her down the stairs to the cellar like last time, the bastards. Wait, she could hear and feel the splashing of water. Was the cellar flooded? They were trying to drown her. She felt herself being roughly tossed into what should have been the pain of cold concrete but, turned, concrete, but turned out to be a submersion in cold water. She could drown. No air. She held her breath until she could no longer and began to take a first gulp of water. Kirsten woke with a jerk to total darkness. She wondered what fresh hell this was. 
The dream had left her gasping for breath, which we, she could only inhale through her nose. Her mouth was gagged, hands and feet tied, and there seemed to be some kind of bag over her head. Her skull was splitting with the headache from hell. There was a faint humming noise in her ears, and she could feel a vibration through the floor where she was sitting. What the fuck was this? Her mind raced, searching for clues. Then she remembered the car and the two Scandinavian men. The murmurings of voices coming closer. She stayed stock still and waited, hardly daring to breathe, difficult as it already was, keeping it slow, shallow and as quiet as her racing heart would allow. The sound of an opening door. Zizazi too? A man's voice sounding foreign. She couldn't decide where from. Oui, a gruff reply. French then. The bag was pulled from her head, but Kirsten didn't dare open her eyes. Contrary to every instinct in her body, deciding to feign sleep until she had more of an idea what the fuck was going on. Cerise is you, said the first voice. Oui, too young and fresh to be homeless or in pute. And what about the guy? said the gruff voice. Suddenly, Kirsten was suddenly aware that she was tied back to back with someone else. She wondered if it might be that bloke she'd found in the street, the one she'd got in the car with. Fucking hell, this is weird. We will deal with him once we are out, replied the first man. Out? Where the fuck were they going? Were they in some kind of factory? Some kind of big vehicle or other? Those two imbeciles are totally useless. They must be severely reprimanded after this fracas. Kirsten was then aware that the presence of the first man was looming closer. The sensation of a hand on her thigh almost made her scream, but she bit her lip under the gag. The hand squeezed her thigh muscle, making her feel physically sick. Mmm, nice, murmured the voice, breathing close to her ear. She could detect the faint odour of alcohol and stale smoke in his breath, the musty tang of an older man. All she could think of now of what it would be the best way to react as she was being raped, as that must surely be what was about to occur. Just then, the person she tied was tied to stirred, presumably into consciousness. <coughs> Came a muffled, lazy sound and nasal drawl from behind her. <coughs> More of the chloroform, said the man closest to her. She heard the twist of a bottle top and they could sense the second captor moving closer. Moments later, the torso was she, was she was bound to went back to its limp state. Elosi, continued the voice. Kirsten now felt a familiar cloth pushed against her nose, then succumbed to the vapour and the slow drift back to oblivion. <laughs>